What's your favourite meme? Oh, I'm a bit old for all that, Adam. Yeah, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, oh, there's some good political ones. Yeah, featuring you, but we'll not go there. No, let's not so do that. Chris, do you have a favourite meme? Well, I quite like, I mean, I know it's used a lot, but that, that one of the couple walking down the street with the bloke... Oh yeah, over his shoulder uh, at, a, at yes. a woman who's just walked. And past didn't Matt him. Hancock have the same shirt as the guy the other day there? Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, he did. He did. As me memes collide, when memes oh. when memes collide. <laughs> when memes um, go bad. That yeah, says. I think one of my favourite ones is the uh, is John Curtis on TV one. Yes, heroic. And memes have collided tonight on Newscast because John Curtis is on TV on Newscast. Hello, Professor Sir John. Hello. <laughs> You're not a big fan of that it's... thing, are you? I can tell. No, Sorry. No, no. I, I, I mean, I mean, I don't, I don't follow it. I mean, it's all good fun, but you know. Um, well, um, eleven so, so, point nine thousand people follow it, Sir John. Well, well, well. You know, so you know, you know, th that's all fine. Um, but anyway, I mean, I, I, to disappoint <laughs> people. Uh, I'm afraid I don't follow it, so you can carry on saying what you think because for the most part, yeah. I don't know what you said. And there are no uh, trolls on Newscast because we love what you've got to tell us about the incredibly complicated elections that we're all going to be reporting on next week. So thank goodness you're here. Thank goodness John Curtis is on TV. Newscast. Newscast from the BBC. Hello, it's Adam in the studio. And Laura in the same studio, but two metres apart, as we still have to be. And Chris, 20 yards down the corridor in my little solitary booth of news. Now, one week from today, the polls will have closed in Scotland, Wales and England on a kind of huge, giant set of elections. I'm trying to... Can I get them all in one go, do you think? Scottish Parliament. Mm -hmm. English local authorities of various types, because mm -hmm. there are many. Senate, Welsh... Parliament, uh, police and crime commissioners mm -hmm. in England, several mayors, Hartlepool by-election. Have I missed anything out? I think you've got it. I thought you yeah, might have forgotten the police and crime commissioners. Yeah. Oh, I was no, just they're, my favorite. they're my favourite. They're my favourite. I had isn't... that chalked up to hold you to account for as well, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> but Mega Thursday, Super Thursday. It hasn't be... got a name, has it? We don't call it Super Thursday. I'm, I'm waiting for a name to emerge for it. Let's start that now. Super Thursday. Yeah. Well, when it is Super Thursday with minus one week, the person you want to speak to is Professor Sir John Curtis, Professor of Politics at Strathclyde University and the man who has... Millions of spreadsheets in his head. Hello, John. Good day to you, Adam. Um, so before we dive into the individual different kinds of contests, do you just have a sort of big thought that you could just inject into us before we start discussing all of this? Well, I guess we can think about what do we think might be a good day uh, for the government and a good day for the Labour Party. So let's sketch it out. A good day for the government will be that the eight point or so lead that's currently in the national opinion polls is reflected in the results of the English local elections. That would mean probably net gain for the Conservatives in, the, in those elections or governments rarely manage that in local elections. You might hang on to most of the Metro mayors, including the West Midlands. Uh, they then perhaps above all might just sneak the Hartlepool by-election and meanwhile, north of the border, uh, Nicola Sturgeon fails to get an overall majority. The Conservatives hang on to second place and the UK government feels emboldened to try to kick the Scottish constitutional question into touch. Uh, conversely, what will be a good uh, a, a session for Labour? Well, uh, to be doing an awful lot better in the opinion polls at the moment, ideally to be seen to be doing better than Jeremy Corbyn did in his first local elections in 2016, mm -hmm. um, which at the time got a pretty lukewarm reception. But you know, a lot of the seats that were being uh, fought over in 2016 are being fought over again this year. But Labour in Wales managed to get an overall majority with 31 seats. They hang on to the heart of all by-election. Oh, yes, and they managed to come second in Scotland. Probably neither party is going to manage to bag all of those wins. But that's probably what both sides ideally would like to see us being reporting. Not, of course, on the Thursday night, because there are very mm -hmm. few overnight counts, but mm -hmm. rather 
by the time it's all over on the Sunday after the election. Well, I was going to say, you've just done in three minutes what it will take about four days of results to (laughs) achieve. Yeah, we'll have Uh Super Thursday, Super Friday, Super Saturday, Super Sunday with Super Sir John from Strathclyde all the way through. And then Knackered Monday. Tired Monday, yeah. 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 John, can I ask you a question about about Scotland and how things are shaping up there? It's entirely self-serving because I'm coming to Glasgow tomorrow for any questions, so I need to bone up. Um, And I just wonder how things are how things are looking. And then I guess the crucial question that we always tend to ask at this stage in an election campaign, is there any evidence that the campaign's made any difference to the relative position of the parties? Yeah, I think the answer to that is, Chris, well, we started off this election campaign with the SNP probably at 50% or just below on the constituency vote. Of course, you know, we have two votes up here. It's a bit more complicated than you have down south. Um, and running at you know 40% or so uh, on the list the truth is that those numbers seem to have come down somewhat and that whereas if you'd asked me at the beginning of this campaign to predict what the the outcome would be i would give my usual answer of well 50 percent chance of the smp getting an overall majority and 50 percent not i think i would i would say the odds on the smp getting an overall majority they're still there they've still got a chance but they have probably lengthened the other thing that certainly happened during this campaign is that Anna Sawa, the relatively new Scottish Labour leader, has certainly got a good press and he's got now rather more people in Scotland thinking favourably of him than unfavourably. And Labour seem to have made a bit of progress in the polls, although crucially for them, they still trailed the Conservatives on their list vote, that other vote. Um, and it's that vote that's probably going to be crucial for determining which party is the second largest um, in the Holyrood Parliament. Thanks, John. I was taking notes then. (laughs) (laughs) With his quill. Um, Now, Laura, I was just thinking today, it's like, why are we not talking more about what the result of the Scottish Parliament election might mean? Because it could be completely, completely seismic, but not completely seismic right there and then. Well, that's right. And it depends, as John's been explaining, exactly how it falls down, because there will be an almighty row, even if the SNP does get what they would really prize as a majority on their own. Mm. There'll then be an almighty row about whether or not that does really give them a mandate to hold another independence referendum. Certainly they will have the right to ask for one. But remember, the legislation is there that the UK government does have the power to say yes or no to having another referendum. It's not in technically the Scottish Parliament's decision making, mm. right? So, the, so if you if you think about it, I know there's been huge attention on this, but if they get that majority on their own, that doesn't mean there's going to be an independence referendum. There's going to be an almighty battle about whether or not there's mm. going to be an independence referendum. Remember, even the SNP themselves disagree over when the right time to have one would be. So, well, yeah, you can say, oh, it would be seismic if they get a majority on their own, especially because Hollywood is set up almost specifically to make it really hard for any one party to get a majority. Mm -hmm. The one doesn't automatically lead to the other, despite what the sort of narrative sometimes has been. And if anything, actually, as Sir John was saying, you know, the SNP appear to have been slipping back a little bit in Mm -hmm. the last few weeks. So what felt, I mean, sorry, it's a very long answer, but I suppose in Westminster, people kind of were starting to assume, oh, this is a kind of unstoppable drift towards independence in Scotland. Mm -hmm. That's just actually not... So to use my geography metaphor then about it being seismic, it's like the San Andreas Fault. It's there. Here we go. Everyone's worried about it or talking about it when or the big one's going to be. And, or excited by it, exactly. Uh, if, you're a, if you're a seismologist. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and yeah, but it hasn't just, the big one hasn't necessarily happened yet. Talk, uh, and, and people are waiting for it. Talking of political seismology uh, in, in one of those sort of uh, attempts at a neat, a neat segue, shall we talk about England and then the picture in England? I think we've got a little whizzy graphic, haven't we, we can show you about how, the, how seats changed hands, at, not just in England but elsewhere, but focusing on England at the 2019 general election and the whole business of this new addition to the political lexicon, the Red Wall, and those gains mm. that the Conservatives made in the English Midlands and and, and north of England. And, of course, we've got the Hartlepool by-election into the, into the mix as well. And I wonder, John, as, as far as polling is concerned, obviously it's sort of national polling rather than local or regional polling, but what the evidence looks like as far as the polls are concerned, as far as this, this, this battle for this territory that for so long was Labour and now the Conservatives feel that they've got a, a bit of purchase on. Oh, I think the the answer to you, Chris, is that the evidence is, is that the Labour Party is on a hiding to nothing in the so-called Red Wall areas. But that doesn't by that I don't necessarily mean that the Labour Party is going to do significantly worse in those places mm. than they did 
in 2019. The th crucial thing we have to bear in mind here is that particularly that half of the English local elections that were last contested in 2016, that is now sephological prehistory. Hmm. It's before the Brexit referendum and it's before the way in which the Brexit process completely reconstructed the coalition that now uh, is behind the Conservative Party. It's a very predominantly a leave one, whereas back in 2015, it was only moderately a leave one. And meanwhile, equally, the Labour vote now, despite the party's best endeavours, is more concentrated amongst the Remain vote and less concentrated amongst the Leave vote. Now, if you look at the... One of the things I've been doing, you know, uh, boring away on my kitchen table during the last six months when people were saying Brexit didn't matter, is to keep on tracking the level of support for the party separately amongst Remain and Leave voters. Mm. And the crucial headline that comes out of that, particularly as far as the Labour Party is concerned, is that there hasn't been any evidence in the last 12 months that keeping stum about Brexit, which seems to be Labour's policy on Brexit, has in any way been effective at persuading Leave voters in particular to come back to Labour Party. So even when the Labour Party was doing relatively well in the autumn of last year and they caught up the Tories in the polls for a while, Yes, their vote went up amongst Leave voters, but it was going up pretty much as much amongst Remain voters. The counter side to this is that, in a way that frankly was perhaps in, would have been inconceivable just a dozen years ago, London is now a one-party capital. Mm. Sadiq mm. Khan looks as though he's going to walk it. Why is he going to walk it? Because of Brexit. Because London is the Remain part of England, and you look at the coalition of people that are going to vote for Sadiq Khan, it is those young... Uh, graduate professionals um, who are in, who don't like uh, John, the, uh, the Brexit who are going to vote for the Labour Party. But one of the things that's fascinating about this election, when you talk to the top brass of both the big political parties and indeed the smaller ones, is this has coming off the back of such a fluid, weird period. So it's not just the two tribes of Leave and Remain and what happened to that. It's also you were having elections everywhere, almost everywhere, after a pandemic. You've also got this geographical shift that happened in 2019 and the first big test of whether or not that's going to say. You've also got in Wales and in Scotland people t looking at constitutional questions. So, John, do you think actually, not wanting to do ourselves out of a job over next weekend's Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday news bulletins, will it be p possible to read anything coherent from the results of these elections? The answer to you is you won't be able to read anything coherent out of the headlines. And I think, in truth, the elections next week will be a spinner's paradise. That, but therefore, means, Laura, that the job that you and I and Chris and Adam will have is actually to explain to people how to make sense of these results, given the complexity. So actually, I would say our job will be even more important than it is in a general election, when, frankly, it's kind of it's obvious who's to... going to win. And once you've worked out who's going to win, that's it. Here, but it will be obvious who's going to win, and we will have to explain to people who has but, done. But that's to, the spirit, big, John. But, but the big picture, though, in by any normal historical comparisons, should be, should it not, Adam, is... 11 years into one party being in charge of the government, they should be having seats tumble away. The opposition should yeah. be gobbling them up. But given what we've been covering this week, this sort of frenzy over sleaze, I just wonder if we can think about what might have been cutting through. Yeah, John, uh, it would be interesting to hear from you with your scientific uh, analysis of public opinion, whether we can scientifically analyse whether public opinion has absorbed the stories we've been talking about, whether it's um, former prime ministers texting the chancellor, whether it's the prime minister's mobile phone habits, whether it's the prime minister's interior decorating habits. Does that stuff, can you tell if that stuff is, is, is in the public's mind? Crucially, above all, I think what we have to bear in mind is that when these kind of stories um, uh, uh, come out, is that people will evaluate them through very much their prior mm. partisan lens. Yeah. So mm. if, we, if we take the polling that Opinium did for the, the Observer last weekend, in which they were asking people about the, the Cameron intervention and the Dyson tax, well, and they then ask people, well, do you think that Boris Johnson is honest, honest or do you think he's corrupt? And Tory voters said he was honest and Labour voters said that he was corrupt. And then uh, there on that, I'll just give you one other point. When you go ask people, who do you believe, Boris Johnson or Dominic Cummings? Well, actually, the most popular answer was neither. 
But amongst <laughs> conservative voters, only seven only seven percent said they believe Dominic Cummings. So well, you've got he was to never a member of the, the Tory Party. Yeah. Proudly, always said he was never sure. a member. But, you, of but the, the point the is, Tory party. the point is, the story has got yeah. to break through the veneer of prior partisan subject. Now, the one re reason why I could see why the flat story might cause more trouble is that very often the way in which, you know, the, the, you know bending the rules can be justified. You say, well, the end justifies the means. I mean, this is clearly the argument that the UK has been, government's been using about various aspects of its handling of the pandemic. The difficulty perhaps is, is what is the, the broad public policy objective that is justified by spending what a lot of money on apparently relatively expensive wallpaper. So that's why perhaps the defense of, well, look, you know, you may not like how we did it, but it was all for the good, might just not be ready for the government in the way that it has been on other issues. Now, I think Laura knows much more about this than I do, so she may have a take on this, but at the moment, my perspective is that at least so, what, so far as what is in the public domain, we're not yet at that point. What a briefing. Thanks, John. Was Professor Sir John Curtis on television? Yes, he was. Extensively. <laughs> <laughs> now, Laura, Parliament prorogued today. Yeah, say that is, when you haven't got your teeth in. Which is the posh word for stopping because yes. there's going to be a Queen's speech in a couple of weeks when it sort of starts again, when it unprorogues or yes. rerogues. I don't know what it is. Um, and there so, are rogues anyway. Yeah. And so there was a bit of a dash to get some legislation through in time. And yes. one of the pieces of legislation was one that's very controversial for all, all sorts of reasons. And it's the, the fire safety bill, which was basically the government's attempt to make sure there's never another Grenfell. That's right. And where they've ended up with is that if you live in a very tall building, there is a fund that can be spent on removing the cladding from your building so that you're safe. And there's all sorts of other things in there about whether you have to pay for a warden to patrol the corridors at night looking for fires. But some people are very, very angry that they've been left out of this legislation. That's right. So the fire safety bill was aimed at making homes safer after the awful, awful tragedy in 2017 when more than 70 people lost their lives. But some MPs, few Tory MPs, lots of Labour MPs, and also a very strong feeling in the House of Lords, were trying to extend the financial pr protection for leaseholders who've basically got stuck in flats mm. that they might not be in the tallest of buildings with the cladding, but since then all sorts of safety concerns and defects have been discovered. And there have been thousands of leaseholders, and we've talked about it on the programme mm. before, haven't we? Thousands of people stuck in flats that there's no way they could sell. They don't feel safe there and they're being hit with these huge bills to try to make things up or even, you know, to have wardens walking around at night mm. to wake people if there were fires. But the people who were pushing for that addition to the legislation, to the law that's gone through, they failed. And there's been a lot of real anger and upset from leaseholders, also from politicians who were trying to make these changes. And it's one of these stories. My goodness, it really, really affects many people's daily lives and a lot of disappointment. What the government would say is they're putting five billion, I think the figure mm, is in, yeah. to try to fix things in the worst situations. And they've also got to think about taxpayers. But there's an awful lot of people, some people would say, you know, mm. a kind of generation yeah. of people just trying to get on the housing ladder who've really suffered here. So that's a lot of homes that's been in the news. But mm. then there's one home that's been in the news a lot yeah. the last few days, the Prime Minister's flat above number 11 Downing Street, which we've been talking a lot about since... Friday when Dominic Cummings, his former advisor, wrote that blog saying mm -hmm. that there'd been some kind of things going on behind the scenes about the funding of it. Um, I was going to say, where have we got to on it? But actually... It's all going out in all sorts of directions now. Well, Investigations left, right and centre. Yes, it's become a very sprawling and potentially a very serious issue for number 10 because the Electoral Commission, which is a legal independent body with the power to sanction uh, political organisations, is now conducting its own investigation. And the short version is the Prime Minister and his, his fiance had a lot of very, very expensive renovation done on the flat above 12 Downing Street, actually, where they live with their oh, son. Oh, not 11. It's actually, well, it's sort of kind of just on the corner. I think some of it's above 11. 11 and, and a half Downing Street. Yeah, 11 and a half Downing <laughs> Street. Um, but the Prime Minister refuses to say who first picked up the bill for that renovation. Now, in the simplest of terms, as with any story, if there's nothing to hide, 
Why doesn't he just say? And there are all sorts of fingers of suspicion and suggestions that Tory donors paid, but there's no record of that happening. And if you wonder why you should give a monkeys about that, I mean, who cares what kind of cushions they've got? Who cares what kind of wallpaper they've got? Actually, quite a lot quite of people are quite yeah. interested. Yeah. But the point is, politicians are meant to declare any cash or loans or anything they get. So we know all what they get up to, right? Mm. Politicians aren't meant to be beholden to any funders. So in this country, we've got a really clear system. If they get any cash, they have to tell us who they get it from. And he hasn't done that in this case so far. And what are we at now? Three confirmed investigations going on. So the Electoral Commission, Laura, as you mentioned, we've got Simon Case, the most senior civil servant in the country, doing his thing as well. And then this guy, Lord Guite, brought in to oversee ministerial interests and job number one in the intray is looking into this. And then the possibility of the Parliamentary Commissioner for Standards getting involved because Labour have asked they at last asked uh, them to have a, uh, a look at it. But what I was struck by today was that Prime Minister on a visit to a school asked about it and was kind of repeatedly dismissive, really, in his language about the whole thing. Nothing to see here, a, a farrago of nonsense, he reckoned. Let's take a listen. I don't think that this is the, uh, the, the, the number one issue uh, for the people of our country. Indeed, uh, by, several, by several orders of magnitude, by several orders of magnitude, I would say what people want... Uh, the government to focus on that, which is uh, exactly what we're doing, yeah, have, is on education, crime and all the other issues that really matter. But Labour are still uh, banging on about it, aren't they? Akia Starmer in Manchester uh, today and, um, well, having some fun with it as well. All he's got to do is answer a very simple question, which is who paid initially for the redecoration of your flat? Now, I'm thinking of people who are watching this. I think most people would say, if I had my flat redecorated, I'd be able to answer that question. Um, so the Prime Minister could actually end this now, tell us who paid for it in the first place, answer the question, pay, take about one minute, um, and then he could get back on with the day job. And where do you go, Laura and Adam, if you're a leader of the opposition and there's a whole row about interior decor, where do you go for your photo op? Well, you go where there is allegedly a quote by somebody who's allegedly been to the Prime Minister's flat and said that they wanted to replace the John Lewis furniture nightmare that had been left by Theresa May. <gasps> so you go to... John Lewis. And you pose for a picture. Oh, look, just casually looking at a piece of <laughs> a roll of wallpaper, <laughs> as you do. And I have to say, having been lucky enough to have a glimpse of the Downing Street flat when Theresa May was there, because mm. we did part of our farewell interview there, and we, it meant that we got a little bit of a look around. Whatever your taste is, it was immaculate and really quite plush and pretty comfy. And mm. I didn't... Well, anyway, if people have different tastes, but it was really quite lavish and, and, and fancy, but perhaps not too... Um, Boris Johnson's taste. Well, we're now joined on Newscast by an actual professional taste maker, I'm going to say. <laughs> it's Celia Sawyer, the interior designer, who you will have seen on Four Rooms on Channel 4 and your home in their hands on BBC One. Hello, Celia. Hello. <laughs> Celia, I'm glad, I'm glad we have video conferencing software so I can see your beautifully appointed apartment. Very <laughs> lush. Uh yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it probably needs a refurb itself now. It's been a while since I've done anything to it. but uh, Does it? Why does it need a refurb? It looks pretty good to me. Well, I'll tell you what happens in your life is you get sort of a bit stale with what you've got around you, and it's really good and refreshing to sometimes just do something completely different again, and it makes you feel good. Help out our, our newscaster who hears the numbers being thrown around, and we know that prime ministers can spend up to... £30,000 a year of taxpayers' money on the flat and think, blimey, how on earth do you end up ratcheting up tens of thousands of pounds of expense for a bit of wallpaper and a new sofa? Well, it's not just a bit of wallpaper and a new sofa. And we don't actually know, do we, or do we know, exactly how much was spent. Uh, do we know? I no, we know. don't know. I mean, figures of up to £200,000 have been bandied around, but we don't know if that really is true. I mean, I think we know it's was sort of more than... 50,000, but we do know that they hired somebody called Lulu Little from Sone, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. So could you tell us and our viewers and listeners a bit about that kind of her designs and the sort of cachet that she has? Um, I don't actually know her at all, and I don't... Burn. Really, <laughs> I don't know her at all, and um, I don't know her work. And I've, I've seen some pictures, obviously, recently, because she's been, you know, this has all been in the news... And it's not the sort of style that I would, uh, you know, 
do for somebody. However, everyone's got different styles and that's the whole point of having your own interior designer so that you bring in whatever, you know, your style is to someone's property. What's in at the moment? Uh, <laughs> I don't follow trends because the reason I don't... You're your own trend. Well, the thing is, I'm more classical because I think to myself, if you follow a trend, then you're going to have to pay to change it again when it's not in fashion and not in trend. Ah, uh, yeah. You know, good, a lot of very, call. very um, over the top wallpapers, a lot of over the top bright colours that probably you would never normally put together. But that's very fashionable at the moment. And I don't put those things together. <laughs> when you look at the pictures of what's rumoured to be in the Downing Street flat, because all the pictures that are out there are actually just from Lulu Little's website rather than actual candid snaps of the Downing Street flat, and you see the, the wallpaper and the sofa and the lamps and stuff, does that seem to match what we think we know of Boris Johnson's personality? Can you imagine that being the sort of stuff that he'd like, that he'd go for? Uh, I don't know if he'd even know what he likes that he would go for, to be honest. <laughs> I would think that probably the female in his in his life is probably in charge of that side of things because he's got other things to think about. Uh, to me, it looks quite chaotic, that sort of um, interior, but perhaps that's what they like. I mean, he's quite a sort of chaotic man, isn't he? He's always got crazy hair and all the rest One of it. One way of putting but, it. Quite, yeah. quite a lot of people would say that Downing Street is quite often likes having a bit of chaos now, around. So maybe that was the design theme. Now, Laura it's, has reported on politics for, what, 20 years now, would you say? I thought you were going to say 100 years. 120, well, no, that's just what the last five years feels yeah. like. And you've got a bit of a theory, haven't you, that basically there's, an, there's a yes. wallpaper connection in politics every couple of years. Yes, so a very prominent Labour figure had to, got into big trouble for spending huge amounts of taxpayers' money on wallpaper. Pop mm -hmm. quiz question, Chris, are you paying attention? Who is that? Yeah, it was the uh, uh, former... Hang on a minute, his name's gone out of my head and I'm oh, going to get it, and I'm going to get it. And Derry Irvine. Derry well Irvine. done, Lord well Irvine. done. That was all very embarrassing for a new Labour at the time. Nearly for me then, then. Then, of course, George Osborne, pop quiz question, Adam, has connections ah. with... Osborne, Osborne and Little, Little Wallpaper. Exactly, the Chancellor, a very prominent figure in the Tory party for a very long time. Uh, and then now we have this around wallpaper. So what is that about? What does wallpaper represent in our national imagination? Or maybe I'm just being a weirdo yeah. by even having this thought. I mean, <laughs> I don't even have wallpaper in my flat. Well, yeah, maybe bare walls. Is wallpaper maybe itself trend. coming back in? Wallpaper's been in and never really gone out. It's oh, just right. <laughs> We've got texture. We've got... Colours, mad colours, big birds, all sorts of weird and wonderful things coming. And that's what happens, you know, it just evolves as does fashion. You know, it's just one of those things, but it's never gone. Actually, <laughs> so see, I'm glad you're here because I've got a bit of an interiors question at the moment because um, I just bought a new armchair a few weeks ago, which I've mentioned a few times on this podcast and I love it. And oh, on a sunny day, just sitting there all curled up with a coffee and a paper. It's brilliant. But... Um, I need a magazine rack, and I just cannot find a nice magazine rack. Magazine racks, really? Well, most people don't read magazines anymore, so that's probably why they're not around, unfortunately. You're just I saying Adam's off-trend, aren't you, Celia? Yeah, he is. You're right. I also bought a new rug the other day there for the living room, which I'm quite pleased about, but then sometimes I think it just doesn't go. So actually, I might send you a picture of it just to get your verdict of whether it just once and for all whether it does actually go or not Celia just before we go doing my due, due diligence as a journalist on your website you say clients include pop stars politicians actors actresses sporting personalities high net worth business people in the public eye did Boris Johnson approach you to come and do the refurb unfortunately not okay but if he had it would have looked very smart well he gets 30 grand a year so maybe he'll call next year <laughs> after seeing you on, on newscast <laughs> And seeing your beautiful flat behind you. Let's hope so, hey. <laughs> Thanks, Celia. Thank, Thank you. you, Celia. My goodness, I always learn a lot on newscasts, but this week I feel like I'm learning more than most. I wonder if, you know, I mean, the studio is looking better than it did a couple of years ago, but maybe we mm. need a refresh. It's Celia looking very... said that's how we make ourselves feel good, is have a refresh every now and it's again. It's looking very Brexit era in here, actually, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. When yeah. we first started doing this. Oh, this feels, yeah. this feels awful. Things have changed a lot since then. You know, it feels awfully what a... 2020 in here, I tell you. I, do. I suppose, actually, if we have a priority, it would have to be Chris's little cupboard, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. Definitely. <laughs> well, it's okay. been a joy being part of the broadcasting furniture on the BBC this evening. Thank you very much for watching and listening. We'll be back very soon. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Newscast. Newscast. Newscast from the BBC.